You're listening to the Biz News Power Hour, brought to you by the team at biznews.com. Stephen Nathan is usually with us on a Tuesday, but uh, today we have you right at the beginning of the week. Nice to see you, Stephen. Uh, there's a very interesting piece that's coming up from the Financial Times a little later in our program tonight, talking about house prices around the world in an absolute boom. It's only three countries that they monitor at the FT have house prices that have not been rising sharply during the pandemic. Uh, one of those countries is not hard to imagine because we know where we sit in South Africa. Uh, is this uh, maybe just to start off with, is it a surprise to see that in the pandemic with more people perhaps working from home, that house prices have been rising and particularly in the United States where often they're selling those houses for more than the than the asking price. Uh, yes, I think you know intuitively the sort of knee jerk reaction is yes, it is surprising because I think COVID, uh, you know, we expected uh, uh, a lot more of an uh, of a negative economic impact globally, and we you know we haven't seen that. And to the credit of central banks, it's really been the proactive nature of central banks that have uh, you know aggressively supported the economy. Uh, you know, and 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 one can't underestimate how aggressive it's been. It's been unprecedented, uh, and and it, and it's and it's worked. You know, so what it's done. Uh, one of the one of the big impacts is that it's lowered interest rates globally. So interest rates are much much lower, and the vast majority of people who take out who 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 buy a home have to finance that via a mortgage. So it's kind of the lower interest rates are, the more affordability you've got. So you know your money stretches further. So when interest rates fall, you can you can afford um, uh, to buy a more expensive property for the same for the same monthly repayment. And and we know that interest rates are at record record lows. Um, also, I think what's important with interest rates is sort of the bank margin. So in South Africa, although our interest rates are at uh, sort of record lows, certainly lows over the last fifty years, we have a repo rate. At three and a half percent, so that means that the commercial banks can borrow from the Reserve Bank at three and a half percent, but the banks have a high margin. They put on another three and a half percent to get their prime rate. So, you know, if you look uh, globally, those bank margins are also very high. So there's a bit of a double whammy that we have in South Africa because we've got high bank margins uh, and we've got much higher interest rates than they have uh, and they have elsewhere. And even even if you look, for example, at the UK and the US, they have what we call negative real interest rates because inflation is higher than interest rates. So it's actually very positive to stimulate uh, demand for housing. And also what we've learned sort of in the in the pandemic is that people's homes have become more important because your home is not just a place where you live. It's, you know, it's become part of your work life as well. So, you know, you've had people sort of trading up uh, 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 you know, buying bigger properties. Um, so that's also been that's also been positive for it. So you know, unfortunately, uh, in South Africa, we haven't we've 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 missed out on that uh, because I think in addition to not having the benefit of, of of low interest rates, also the sentiment in South Africa is not great. Uh, you know, so so you know, uh, property transactions are not buoyant, whereas internationally they're very buoyant, and 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 also the government's done. Uh, other things to help. So, for example, in the UK, quite shortly after the COVID, um, when it when it first hit, uh, so probably around about April, May of last year, the government reduced property tax. They had a transfer tax, so they had a sort of a moratorium to stimulate the market. You know, and I think that's something we really lack in South Africa is a is a is a is a proactive uh, uh, monetary policy to to help the economy get back on its feet. Um, another thing that's also quite interesting is that in the US, uh, when you borrow. For a uh, for a home, uh, you actually get your interest is tax deductible. Uh, so that's another incentive because the US they are very uh, pro home ownership, uh, and it's it's a it's a st statistic that they watch very closely, uh, and it's something that they promote. So they've got uh, you know a lot of incentives. They even have the government uh, uh, what they call government sponsored entities. So we might have heard of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, which which actually buy these mortgages. So there's a lot of sort of facilitation to to, to get that going, it's generally a, a uh, you know an attractive market for the homeowner for the buyer, and COVID has has on top of that uh, you know created much lower interest rates and some also some more tax incentives along the way. 
That's very interesting. The point of trying to promote home ownership, trying to get a bigger middle class, is something that we've completely missed in South Africa, perhaps because of political ideology. But a bigger story to all of this is the value of South African assets generally. Magnus Haystek has been going to town on this story for a while now, saying that not only is our GDP per capita falling, in other words, that we are our economy is growing slower than the population growth in South Africa, but that the value of our assets in global terms has also been declining. How serious is that? Do we really need to worry about that, given that we are citizens and living in South Africa? And I guess for the majority of people in this country, you're not really going to be looking to take your assets or try and establish yourself elsewhere. Of course, there are many people who want to do that. But for most people, they're not really thinking along those lines. So is it really relevant that our uh, assets or the value of our wealth as South Africans is not keeping up? I think it is relevant. It's relevant in 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 like several several areas. I can't think of. Let's put it this way. I can't think of a reason why it would be a good thing. Um, so so you know. So let's say why you know uh, why why could it be a bad thing? Um, you know, uh, um, having an asset is really important because you know previously we've spoken about just the the social impact. I mean, if you have if you have an asset, then you have something to protect. Protect. You have something to fight for. Uh, and we've seen that in the insurrections and the uprisings, you know, people that had something to fight for, like the taxi industry, for 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 example. So, so having an asset is really important uh, from for 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 social stability and, as you say, creating a middle class. But it's very important uh, for for progressing in society from a financial perspective because you know, if you have an asset, then you can borrow. Uh, against that asset to buy another asset or to invest in another asset. I mean, a classic example would be would be a home. You know, if you if you if you want um, uh, if you want to get a home loan, you have to have a deposit. So you've got to be able to you know that could be twenty percent uh, of the value. So you've got to be able to get that money somewhere, and that could be an asset that you've had. You know, maybe you build up an asset, uh, uh, some kind of uh, an investment portfolio, and you use that. But if you've got a home, uh, and then and then you've you've uh, paid down a portion of your bond, then you can access a portion of that bond and maybe invest a little bit in the business or maybe, you know, uh, 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 take a portion of your bond to fund your child's education uh, or maybe, to, you know, and so so it's, it's critical to have an asset. Uh, uh, but relative to, to, yeah. relative to the rest of the world. And I think this is really the, uh, I, I don't think anybody could argue with you what you've just said now, but is it important that South African assets keep track with those of elsewhere in the world. Uh, I'm being devil's advocate here. I do know the answer, well, but, you know, it depends. but let's get your I, thoughts. I mean, I guess, yeah. Listen, it depends. It depends what you mean elsewhere in the world. I mean, uh, you know, because because it, these things are quite difficult to measure. So, for example, you know, one of the things you would look at is you would look at uh, sort of sort of household wealth to GDP, you know, and you can say we can, we can, we can compare that around the world. And the U.S. has always been right at the very top of, you know, the, 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 uh, the household uh, or the, the uh, household assets uh, to, to, to GDP. So, so, you know, if you look, generally speaking, the, the, the most prosperous countries uh, tend to have the highest, uh, the highest wealth levels relative to GDP. So it is important, not because it's a competition between, you know, who's the, you know, who's the wealthiest uh, country, but it's, you know, you know, who has the most financial resources uh, to uplift society. And I'm not saying the U.S. has done the best job because in many instances, uh, they, 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 they're very wealthy, but they also have quite a skewed income. Um, but it certainly gives you much more flexibility because the bigger your wealth, the, bigger, the more wealth there is in a country, then the more people will spend. So that will lead to higher GDP. The more GDP in a country, the higher the taxes for the government uh, to spend uh, and to hopefully to spend that uh, fruitfully. So, you know, it, it, it is important, but the relative, the, you know, the relative is hard to do. But you know, for example, in South Africa, we have very high inflation. Uh, so if you compare us to the U.S., you know, we have inflation, you know, five six percent, and that's relatively low because sort of fifteen years ago it was at almost ten percent. Um, but in other countries, you've got very low inflation, one two percent. Now, what happens in a high inflation environment is that even if your 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 assets, let's say we it's, let's say we have a five percent inflation, and let's just say your assets go up by by uh, by five percent, so they're not growing ahead of inflation, but you're actually taxed in nominal terms. So so you know that would be bad because you're actually paying more tax because tax actually works 
in a normal environment, not a real environment. Uh, and you know, so 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 you know, the point being is that uh, 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 is that you want to have an attractive uh, environment where asset prices go up because. If I've got a business or a property, you know, I'd like to sell that at, a, at, a, at some kind of profit and then that'll motivate mm. me to invest more and well, more. Well, yeah, the investment, uh, you, you sacrifice to build wealth. And if there is no benefit of your sacrifice, you stop sacrificing and then you not don't create jobs. And that, or you take your money offshore. You, As an example, you might take yeah. your money offshore. You might say, you know, and obviously, you know, Magnus has been quite strong, strong on that. But you might say, well, you know, uh, and, and, and we need investment to create jobs. So, you know, you know, you want to create an attractive investment horizon for everyone to benefit from. Mm. Uh, Stephen, uh, the the whole story about, and that really flows quite well into a conversation that we're going to have in a little while with Terence Corrigan, who's been banging the drum against expropriation without compensation. Uh, this, this policy that the ANC and the EFF have been collaborating on to change the constitution so that they effectively can steal from citizens. Now there's been a bust up between them. The EFF wants, uh, one, wants more than the ANC is prepared to deliver. And I guess those who don't want to see expropriation without compensation going through are celebrating now uh, on the news that the, they aren't going to be voting together. But how important is that? Is the, the, the fact that, that we have property rights and that your property that you own uh, cannot be taken away from you by the state, as is being proposed in South Africa. Mm. Uh, property rights is one of the most fundamental uh, rights for a uh, fair, free uh, and prosperous economy, both for its citizens and for uh, uh, international uh, companies and, and, and people to invest in that country. So it's almost, you know, if you had a look at the top three, uh, you know, you know, criteria, it would definitely be in the top three because who would invest in a, uh, a country, as I, both if you're a citizen uh, or if you're a foreigner, who would invest in that country uh, if there was a reasonable chance that your investment could go to naught? And if we look at what's happening in China, you know, that is, there's, there's, there's elements of that. There's elements of, of, you know, we're not being protected and maybe the investments we thought we had is actually not really an investment because it's done through some kind of a structure that might not be legal in that country. And we can see what that has done to the, you know, the Chinese uh, tech companies in a very short space of time, and that's symptomatic. Uh, uh, you know, who would who would invest in that country? And there's so many places to invest uh, that, you know, in order to attract capital, uh, you know, you've got to you've got to stack up stack up to uh, uh, you know that criteria that meets with a reasonable investment. Because imagine investing in a country where you know they said that uh, it's now public knowledge this um, uh, expropriation without compensation and you go in and you invest money there, it'd be very difficult to explain that to your investment committee or your trustees uh, if you were a, 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 a foreigner. So it's very, very concerning. And I think it's also, it caught a lot of us uh, uh, off sides because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't an ANC policy. Uh, and we've seen even President uh, Mbeki come out and say, no, no, this actually is not an ANC policy. And this is not, you know, this is not what the ANC uh, wanted and, and stood for. So it's very controversial all around, even within the ANC. And as you say, it seems to be that the radical, uh, the radical uh, economic transformation side of the ANC were probably pushing this agenda. Uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it's good to see that, uh, that the ANC now is not siding with the EFF, that there are differences. And that this, you know, that this is in jeopardy. Um, so, you know, that in itself is a good sign. But, you know, given given the issues we have in this country, you know, you just wish that government would focus on the imperatives uh, that are actually going to create growth and create jobs. Uh, not a lot of the side shows, I would say side shows, but, you know, certainly not a lot of the things that actually aren't going to have a positive impact in uh, the short term. In fact, they might have a very detrimental impact, um, you know, but we just need focus on areas that matter to address our our problems for all uh, for all of you know uh, all of South Africa. You're listening to the Biz News Power Hour, brought to you by the team at biznews.com.